Hello, this is Jack Foley, and I'm speaking to you from Oakland, California, on a very warm day. Uh, there's a fan going on above my head. Welcome to Global Warming. Shajul Anthru has asked me to talk about poetry for about 30 minutes. We'll see if we can do that. We'll see if you're up to listening about poetry for about 30 minutes. One of the odd things about poetry and becoming a poet, which I've been for many, many years, since I was about 15 and I'm 80 now. One of the odd things about poetry is its strangeness. There's a peculiarity about anyone who becomes a poet, certainly including myself. Something strange has happened. It exiles you. It's a little bit like the great question that Heidegger would, would ask. You know, why are there things that are? Why are there beings rather than nothing? Why? It's a difficult question. And it alienates you from the abundant life that surrounds you. It alienates you from your friends in certain ways, though you may have friends who are also interested in the arts. But it's a problematical thing. It's a strangeness. And so a good deal of a poet's life and writings have to do, has to do with explaining or trying to understand that strangeness. Somebody, uh, it's a little story, true story. The sandwich store was popular and very busy. Sandwiches were made from scratch. On this day, there was a long line of patient, expectant people. A young woman ordered three complicated sandwiches. She said to the server, while you make my sandwiches, I'm going to read you some of my poetry. She pulled out a notebook and began to read. The person who told me this story explained that the woman's poems were all about her mother. She hated her mother. He added, you're probably acquainted with this woman. We are angels of reading. We read the book of the blue sky, which masks the blackness and infinity of space. Our home is with the infinite. No? Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. I wrote this little poem as a kind of uh, parody, but it's a serious parody. And um, it comes from a French tradition, um, though it's not only French, of writing tomb poems. Um, poet goes to the tomb of another poet whom he admires and writes a poem about that being there in the presence, albeit the dead presence. So I, I, I wrote a poem about being at the tomb of Jack Foley, me. It has a little little uh, superscription, as they say, something above the writing. I know what becomes of the piggy if the piggy's unable to scram. It's the piggy's sad fate to be served on a plate and be known by the cognomen Ham at the tomb of Jack Foley. Miraculously preserved by the miracle of microfiche, his poems influence only those who have not read them. Here he lies, which is not to say that he didn't lie in other places too. Language came to him when he was 15 and told him, I am about to offer you a career which will give you neither money, nor power, nor influence, nor any special capacity with the fairer sex. Mostly you'll be ignored. How about it? Why not, he said. So what if I starve? And so it began. As it happened, 
starve. He did not. He wrote volumes and volumes, proclaimed his folly to a world which, though bored with its distractions, yawned or made a violent gagging sound at the mere mention of poetry. Mourn for him not, dear reader. He did what he wished, speaking his mind at every opportunity, whether it was appropriate or not, and not minding the raspberries or raised middle fingers. Remember what a friend said upon introducing him. Don't let Jack scare you. Ars longa, Jack Brevis. Art is long, Jack is brief. Foley sighed. His pocket's empty, but his verse was free. I need to talk to you about how I got into this mess of poetry. How it became my life's work. How it determined my life. There are many ways in which that's true. And one of the ways you could think of my poetry is as an attempt to understand why certain events of that kind happened to me. Here's how I began as a poet. It's, this is from a, a, a book called uh, A Backward Glance or Traveled Roads, which is a quote from Walt Whitman. And it's just a little introductory moment but I talk about the way in which poetry came to me. Poetry arrived in my consciousness in more or less the same way that the words, soul, soul, why dost thou persecute me, arrived in the consciousness of the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. At the age of 15, like most of my friends, I thought of poetry as more or less inconsequential, old fashioned, dull. A teacher's suggestion that I read Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard from 1750 changed all that. The poem seemed to me the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. It affected me so deeply that I wanted it to have come out of me, not out of Thomas Gray. I understood myself to be a poet. Gray's poem told me something about Gray, but it told me even more about myself. On the face of it, it seemed like an extremely unlikely event. Thomas Gray was an English poet, a letter writer, a classical scholar, and a professor at Pembroke College, Cambridge. He published only 13 poems during his lifetime. I was an ambitious Irish-Italian working-class kid who was aware of what the British, Thomas Gray was British, had done to the Irish. Yet at such life-changing moments, none of that matters. To be a poet meant to change your life. The 15-year-old half-Irish child suddenly transformed himself into an adult 18th century British formalist. From there, I began to interrogate the entire history of poetry. The story of my intellectual life is the story of my finding or trying to find what Wallace Stevens called, what will suffice. But the history of the mind is not like the history of a tree. It is not a traditional, linear, Bildungsroman. The mind moves in various directions, more or less simultaneously, until one suddenly finds oneself in a magic castle at the edge of the sea, looking at a mate who is both deeply familiar and completely unknown. If the cowboy usually jumps on the horse, and rides further west, a mind boy jumps on the horse, Pegasus, and rides off in all the directions that are. 
One of the things that struck me, and it's a kind of mantra, was the perception of the 20th century, and it's one of the deepest perceptions of the 20th century, is that portions of the mind don't know what other portions of the mind are doing, even though they are all active. You can find this in Freud, you can find it in all kinds of people uh, in the 20th century. Uh, Freud's interpretation of dreams was actually published, I believe, in, right at the beginning of the 20th century, that um, some parts of the mind don't know what other parts of the mind are doing. How can you express that in a poem? One way, of course, is multiple voices. And though I do a number of poems with a partner, my love and poetic partner, Sangi Land, we weren't able to team up for that for this reading, unfortunately. So we're doing what we can. Here, I'll read you a little poem in which I'll disguise my voice for part of it. There are two voices in this poem. There is a moment, what windy trails we follow in every authentic poem or story as we age, at which the poem or story what enterprises hollow tells the author these darkening trails we follow? Why she or he wrote it? Songs grow deep and hollow. We may call this moment, turn the page, climax. What windy trails we follow. Revelation, as we age, the moment at which mind is near. And I wrote this for a friend, Janine Cannon, who passed away just recently. Most of my friends have passed away, though I have younger friends as well, happily. It's one of the things that happens. Um, People wish you long life, and it's good of them to do that. Thank you, folks. It's it's nice. They, they're sincere, and they want you to have a, a long, prosperous life. What they don't tell you is that not everybody has it. And so a long, live person like me finds himself in a situation in which so many of his friends, people who he thought he would know for his whole life long, die off. It's a problem. This is for Janine Cannon, and she was a follower of Amma, A-M-M-A, the uh, Hindu saint, I guess, um, who has been uh, involved in Kerala, where Shajil is. Um, and uh, which is, of course, the origin place of literature Let's R W. For Janine Cannon. Yesterday I saw a sign on a car, AMA, A M M A. So I knew your spirit was near. Now today is your birthday. AMA was watching over you, making sure I knew. I don't believe in saints, though I know you believe in this one, the hugging saint. And I certainly find her an extraordinary and compassionate being, mother, Emma, mama. Dear Janine, I've known you for years and seen your intelligence move constantly towards the holy. Quote, sadly, we cannot realistically expect an uncultured, undereducated, and hyperactive society like the contemporary United States to appreciate poetry. For art is actually love and never for oneself alone. Each poem, each story becomes just one more offering to what is, one more expression of thanks and praise. Those words are all by Jean. My love, Sangi, 
ask me for hugs, and I try to supply them. Each time I do, I think of you and Amma, and of a mother I never had, and of course, deeply of the dear, dear person my arms enclose. One more expression of thanks and praise. Now I'm going to take a short break and though the machine here is going to continue to record and get myself some water. This is June in California. I have a number of things that happened to me in June during my lifetime. It's very strange. And um, the month is a significant one for me. And I have a poem about that. June 6, 1955. I appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, then called Toast of the Town. I was singing with the Porchester Senior High School Choir. Sullivan, I learned, was from my hometown, Porchester, New York. We sang Beyond the Blue Horizon, and you'll never walk alone. There is video on YouTube. I'm in the front row. Big hair, big eyes. At one point, as the choir drifted off pitch, a wonderful soprano, Norma Vitti, saved us all by singing loudly and clearly the right note. No one seems to know what became of her, of the many stars appearing on the show. Bob Hope was the only one who spoke to us. In person, they all looked at least 10 years older than they looked on television. June 1962. Rerun performance at Cornell University of Tom Jones, a musical based on Fielding's novel. I wrote the lyrics and co-performed a tap dance with steps I learned from my father. My friend Warren Wexler wrote the music. The book was written by people who disliked each other, Mike Abrams and Stephen Salon. Even as Warren and I wondered what more might be done with the show, the extremely successful film, Tom Jones came out. A member of the cast wrote me, Tom Jones is the funniest movie I have ever seen in my life. June 25th, 1974. On June 25th, 1974, I was utterly depressed about my writing. I had just brought our car in for servicing, never a happy obligation and taken the bus back home. I was extremely tired and believed at that moment I would never produce anything of any value. Glancing at a collection of Charles Olson's essays, particularly at Human Universe, I noticed a sentence which began, if there is any truth at all to the idea that, certain that nothing would come of it, I typed on a piece of paper, if there is any truth at all, and added, as if in commentary, turning the line into iambic pentameter, there is. I went on to appropriate others of Olson's phrases, changing them if I felt like it. Olson actually wrote, it is not the Greeks I blame. It began, if there is any truth at all, there is. It is the Greeks I blame, the lines in which speech takes place, and Melville did. Next, I took a recent passage from my journal. A waking dream. Someone, me, not me, on a rooftop, being chased. Crowds, the man's friends, below, holding a net which looks like an awning, urge him, tremendous distance. The man jumps, he misses the awning. I remark, 
it is remarked to me, he didn't check which way the wind was blowing. I then retyped that passage, moving my fingers slightly so I would hit some of the wrong keys, and leaving out some of it, revising as I went along. A web should dream, so I'm one bit near off the wind, Chris, Crids, the man's friends, Bicker, Gibder, Gabet, Kidge, Kurge, Abwawel, Grebe, tremendous distance, Irge. Urge him to kilowatts. My depression vanished. The poem suddenly came alive. Its seemingly obvious discovery that literature was made out of letters was extraordinarily liberating. And its concluding lines only half understood when I wrote them, the page is not the natural dividing point, thrust me into an entirely new direction. A sequence of such poems followed. I called it Letters, and I dedicated it to the Six Marx brother, Typo. I believe I understand now, 2021, what happened on that day. My verse had achieved a strangeness, which I believe it had lacked, and which it turned out I passionately desired. The man's friends, but give the bet kids, courage have wow, grieve tremendous distance, urge, urge him to kilowatts. June 17th, 1985. Appearance with Ivan Arguez at Larry Blake's Rathskiller in Berkeley. My first real poetry reading, paired with Adele, of course. I was astonished to discover that people reacted to my poetry, amazed that they wished to know me because of it. Someone envious said to me, you've read the classics, haven't you? I haven't. Someone else was amazed by my poem based on an ancient Irish story, Sweeney Adrift. She said over and over again, what a poem, what a poem. Summoning up my years of obscurity, the poem dedicated to Ivan began, welcome to the house of failure. See, these are the structural bases of the house, its beams and arteries, its artificial light, its hands, its vast appendices. Who is not here? The range of things delights us. Welcome, welcome. See, there is the door that opens for us. Welcome. That's what I had to say at that time. And I'm going to finish with a poem that talks about Walt Whitman, the great poet whose name, unfortunately, means white man. This is a poem about a poem, so it can be called an expoesis. It's about a poem of Whitman's, which is one of the, the great poems of the 19th century. Out of the cradle, endlessly rocking. I don't think there is another poem more unique and simultaneously more representative of what we may call the American spirit than this amazing presentation of the making of a poet, of the transformation of anyone from childhood to a condition of knowledge. How do we enter the world in a deep way? It is an aria, a performance, something Whitman saw in the opera houses. It is a multi-voiced, multi-selved poem in which all sorts of styles and voices are brought together, including the hissing voice of the old crow in the sea, 
and the voice of the bird, my dusky demon and brother, the lone singer wonderful. There's a poem about family, the he-bird, the she-bird. There's a poem about the stunning fact of death, the opener, and the great representation of the sea, Melville. The sea is the openness of consciousness. It is a nature poem in which the outsetting bard merges with what he sees. It includes Quakers, Ninth Month Midnight, and Native Americans, Pomonic. It is Whitman giving himself over to the sheer possibilities of music as world becomes word, translating. It is an act of marvelous empathy and compassion in the literal sense, feeling with. It is a poem about the body and its transformation, even as Whitman speaks of the soul. It is a poem in which the lorn bird and the transforming boy move us to what Wallace Stevens called a new representation of reality. This, camarados, is the great mythic moment of American letters, and it takes place not at a desk, but outside, not as writing, but as brilliant, spontaneous, unexpected utterance. It ushers in under the magical multi-veiled moon in the presence of the vast talkative sea. Nothing less than the world as song. And I'll end with a poem titled for its day, December 2020. The holy season, but what is holy, luminous in this serenity? What can we say opens the heart to the larger life? I saw it as a child in Thomas Gray and Thomas Wolfe and Shelley. If winter comes, my age is my winter. The life which James Joyce identified with a woman's disordered thoughts as she falls asleep. And then with the vast sea. Those are my remarks about the strangeness of poetry. I hope it nudges you towards something that I've tried to get at my whole life long, a way in which poetry moves you towards a larger life, towards sympathy, compassion, if you know Joyce's story, James Joyce's story, The Dead, you'll know what I mean. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes as he moves outward from egotism into the perception of a larger world. The nature of that world, I can't tell you. But it was language, poetry, that brought me to it. And whatever hints and guesses, as Whitman puts it, whatever hints and guesses there are in my poetry of that world are due to a number of factors, including Thomas Gray, Walt Whitman, including my love for the world, including my desire to get out of the world. N'importe où, n'importe où, or du monde. Both Baudelaire, quoting Thomas Hood, anywhere, anywhere, out of this world. Thanks for listening. <laughs>